The Sonic movie sucks. For a lot of you, that's gonna be a hard pill to swallow, and I of all people should know because I've been swallowing this pill for every one of the six times I've watched this film. Ever since in theaters on the day before release day. I was that hyped to watch this movie because you gotta understand, I was already a Sonic fan for six years up to that point, and that was during the mid-2010s, where the public perception of modern Sonic was how he was portrayed in the disappointments of Sonic Lost World and Sonic Forces, so you better believe in the six years that I waited for the Sonic film to release, I was holding on to it like any Sonic franchise would at the time, as a beacon of hope to restore Sonic's character into what it distinctly was during its glory age on a Hollywood level. However, the Sonic the Hedgehog film crumbles at achieving a definitive representation of Sonic the Hedgehog in every aspect. Because instead of embracing the principles that once made Sonic universally loved by all ages, this movie rejects them in favor of its own interpretation that, quite frankly, sucks. Here's how. To understand how the Sonic movie ruined Sonic to a point where he isn't even Sonic anymore, we need to first understand what made Sonic good in the first place, and by analyzing the source material, I think most of us can agree that it comes down to these three principles. First, heroism. When I was growing up, Sonic was a character one could look up to, and I mean that in the sense he always stood up for others. This happened in Unleashed, Black Knight, Generations, Colors, even Forces to some extent. And this wasn't restricted to the modern era. This was a defining trait ever since Sonic 1 made you free those animals trapped by Robotnik. However, throughout this entire film, instead of fighting for others, Sonic is only seen fighting for himself. That's quite literally the entire conflict of this movie, and although it can be argued that this is irrelevant if the movie Sonic is seen helping others in the sequel, it is important to account for the fact that these writers were largely uncertain if they would even be able to make a sequel in the first place. Therefore, it is fair to be critical of this film in a standalone perspective. Although I am grateful the writers such as picked this flaw, it nonetheless is inexcusable that it even was a flaw to begin with. If there was one thing City Escape established, it's that Sonic follows no rules but his own. He's willing to escape the federal government to drift around doing the right thing no matter what life-threatening risks there are. He lives to be free and ambitiously adventure the world. In this film, his ambition is there, but it's so all over the place that it doesn't really align with his character development. Well, sorta. Sonic is consistently ambitious throughout this whole film. He's finding new hobbies, then he's playing baseball with himself, and then he's finishing his bucket list while making a friend. The only difference you really can notice here is that he's getting less clumsy with his ambition as time goes on. Almost as if he's getting more comfortable and confident with being himself. And that's totally the pattern, by the way. Especially after confidence brings Sonic back up to life and recognize that the past two reality checks means he needs to start taking things seriously. This finals of battle scene is amazing. It symbolizes Sonic maturity from a kid who runs from his problems away to the Sonic we know who fearlessly takes things head on. And because of this, this scene was phenomenal. Or at least it would have been because right after we see Sonic return to the same childlike behavior we saw in the first 30 minutes, making this movie's whole journey useless. What? Listen, according to the writers themselves, this is supposed to be a Sonic the Hedgehog origin movie. So it's fair to expect a definitive Sonic the Hedgehog by the end of it. But a Family Guy type of Sonic is a terrible outcome. There are reasons why Sega doesn't put Sonic's parents on its video game covers, let alone mention their very identity, because Sonic is supposed to inherently have a live-free attitude. A lot of his theme songs are literally just about being free with the wind. Look, there's nothing wrong with Sonic wanting to be part of a family at the start. Because then, he's lonely, irresponsible, and confused. I mean, it makes sense why he's looking for authority here. I mean, that's literally why Sonic was so reluctant to disobey Longclaw's orders. But at the end, after he went through that journey of Tom building up Sonic's confidence and finally letting him know that he's special, right here, this should have been the moment that Sonic realized he needed to get up because his life purpose was beyond an immature goofball living in an isolated life in Green Hill. So he builds up the bravery to counter Eggman himself and then later, you know, dips into the sequel's journey. That's how you end a Sonic origin film, by actually producing the free and independent Sonic we know. So if this was so easy to add, then why did the writers choose to make Sonic essentially unaffected by this movie story? Oh, it's because they strictly see Sonic's on-screen value as being a cute silly kid, and this violates Sonic's core principle of being cool so badly that it actually harms his very core character. And to prove this, we could look at Sonic Movie 2. Yes, I know this movie is about Sonic Movie 1, but Sonic Movie 2 carries a legacy established by Sonic Movie 1, so it's worth mentioning. Throughout this film, it feels like there's this law that if Sonic does anything of a spectacle, it must be accompanied with something that cancels it out like he's a little silly kid. 
Is Sonic running on water? Make him fail. He's only a silly little kid. Is Sonic fighting off badniks in the slow motion? Make him fight like a silly little kid. Is Sonic at his definitive moment of his character development so far, being asked to why did he give up the Chaos Emerald? Don't say something in character like, because having power isn't about keeping it for yourself. Say it's because he prefers being a silly little kid, and he likes the color blue. Do you see what I mean when I say this reliance on keeping Sonic a cute chubby child makes Sonic as a character bland in these movies? Now it's time to address the elephant in the room. The amount of jokes and meaningless pop culture references. They are cheesy, dumb, and very stale. Now I know the immediate rebuttal to this is that, oh well Sonic makes tons of quips and jokes in the games, it's part of his character. But unless we're talking about Sonic Colors, which has terrible writing, and everyone knows that, Sonic only makes jokes if, one, they have value, and two, if it's an appropriate time to say them. This is unlike Sonic Movie, and in some cases Sonic Movie 2, where the film is constantly makes Sonic spit out all these jokes and references with negative value non-stop. And by negative value, I just mean that if the writers removed this line, the film would literally have more impact. One example of this would be the flossing scene, which I know this may seem like a huge nitpick, but at this moment of the film was where Sonic had his first confrontation with Eggman head on, and he was victorious. But instead of having Sonic proudly doing his own iconic breakdance, which is a steeple in the games, they decided to assassinate his spirit in favor of a pop culture reference that got zero laughs. Another example would be a little earlier, where Sonic is chaotically dealing with his first fatally armed drone assembled by Robotnik. And during this, he makes this line about Amazon delivery, which completely distracts the viewer from the actual tension going on, and in some ways, makes the viewer not even care about the tension. If Sonic doesn't seem worried about the threat Eggman's hunt poses, then why should the viewer? Ultimately, this just holds back this movie's character dynamics from being so much more valuable. Like Eggman, they do such a good job at making him seem psychotic as a character, but terrible, and I mean a terrible job, at making him threatening to Sonic. Sure, he wants to dissect Sonic alive, but that's only mentioned like one line, and on top of that, Sonic goes from caring to not caring to caring again to not caring at all about this. This ultimately makes Eggman's threat quite forgettable, and as a result, Eggman's threat is so minuscule in this movie that the writers had to shoehorn this line in the final fight. This is my power, and I'm not using it to run away anymore. I'm using it to protect my friends. He was never after your friends! The filmmakers kind of do the same thing in the second film, where they do an amazing job on building up Eggman as a sinister menace, but completely drops all that energy in the third act by making him act like a complete circus clown. Like, my plans are going to take over the universe, then the multiverse, then who knows, which is like, that's the most cliche generic thing you could ever say. Lastly, as for the whole friendship dynamic between Tom and Sonic in the movie, it's not terrible as an idea, I understand why they're trying to tie in a human interaction to a Sonic story, but the problem is that this friendship is so Sonic Forces-esque, and I mean that in the sense that it feels like this movie spends more time talking about your friendship than actually doing your friendship. Like in the bar scene, in the motel scene, and pretty much every scene besides the last, Tom is so clearly annoyed by Sonic's presence, and when he isn't, it's literally just because he feels bad. It makes the whole, our friendship's gonna beat you thing at the end feel so forced. Probably because Sonic forces with the story inspiration. But later on, and this becomes really apparent to the second film, this friendship dynamic is a lot more like this dad child family thing, which is just so weird for a Sonic movie because, again, being parented completely goes against Sonic's live free with the wind nature, and secondly, it makes the endings feel like you just watched an Alvin and the Chipmunks movie. Which is bad. There was literally no reason for Sonic not to be leading in an independent heroic trio running off into the sunset by the end of this film which would have been a great setup for Sonic 3, by the way. Especially if he just proved himself capable of doing so. But, nope. A fully developed movie Sonic must want to be part of a James Mars and family for the next movie because we all know how integral it is to include whatever these side plots were. Ugh. Many of you might be wondering why I'm even criticizing this kid's movie, and second, why I'm even criticizing the sequel as well. Well, firstly, age demographics has never meant you cannot criticize something, especially if that thing is supposed to be intended for a wider range of audiences. Second, it's important to criticize the first and the second film because the third movie is coming soon. In fact, the trailer could even be released tomorrow. So with that in mind, because the first movie, which failed at being an origin movie, and the second movie pretty much reverted all progress made, this third movie needs to be THE Sonic movie. All I'm saying is that the people of Paranaut need to realize that Sonic doesn't have to be this annoyingly hyperactive child restricted to family life to attract audiences. 
because if it is already proven that the natural too cool for school stylish drift for Sonic could even enhance the cinematic feeling of a blockbuster, then is it not even worth at least allowing this Sonic the Hedgehog an attempt on the big screen? You know, this is probably how semi the classic Sonic fan felt when Sonic was released. Unfortunately, I think I understand him now. And Sonic shoot. <laughs>